guys, there's so many muscles on the human figure that honestly, you're just never ever gonna see as an artist. Because if you guys go really deep in terms of anatomy, it's like layer upon layer upon layer, and it's like a basket. It's just very, very complicated. But the thing is, a lot of the muscles, they're just not visible as an artist. And so honestly, this is my opinion, okay? Don't bother with it. You can, I mean, I know people who are scientific about studying anatomy as artists. I don't really get into that stuff because I get very overwhelmed. So in my opinion, if you just learn a couple of key muscles, you can really ignore everything else. For example, this is a muscle called the pectoralis minor that is attached to the rib cage on the front. The thing is though, the pectoralis minor is covered by the pectoralis major. And so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool to know that the minor is there, but as an artist, you don't really need that information. I mean, you got all these other things to think about. You guys have to think about how your material is working. You have to think about your composition. Like, I don't need to think about pectoralis minor when I really need to be focusing on the pectoralis major because that's the muscle that is really going to make the difference. For example, Angie is saying, my anatomy lessons were handled like I was in medical school. Most of the stuff wasn't necessary for art. It really is not. I mean, I had a teacher in graduate school and just looking at his diagrams just made my head hurt. And so I remember when I watched him do these lessons, I was like, I'm never gonna teach it that way because I just find it horrible <laughs> to have to process all that information. I think the more important thing that you guys understand with muscles is that you look for overlap. Where does one muscle overlap over another? Because that's a very sculptural concept. And you really do have to think about this like a sculptor. So for example, the muscle I'm showing you guys right now, the one that's highlighted in orange, those are the serratus muscles. But the thing is, half of the serratus muscles, they're covered by the latissimus dorsi. And so this is important because some people might do these two muscles as just being side by side, but they're not. One is actually underneath the other. So if there's anything you guys really want to be conscious of for all muscles, not just latissimus dorsi, you guys will notice that this happens <clears throat> in multiple places on the human figure. And when you start to notice the overlaps, that's when the anatomy, I think, really starts to make a lot more sense. So for example, here, the yellow muscle, this is latissimus dorsi, very, very thin muscle. In, in fact, you barely see it at all. It's really hard to see on the surface, but it's underneath the trapezius, which is the blue muscle you're looking at here. And so if there's anything you guys want to focus on, it's the overlap. What goes on top of something else? And I really like this point from Seven Angelic who says, I know I don't need to know the names, but I do find it fun to learn as long as it's not on the exam. <laughs> well, we don't give exams here at ArtProf, so you guys don't have to worry about that. But yeah, don't stress about the names. I mean, it is sort of fun to say sternocleidomastoid, but ultimately the more important thing is that you can identify it in terms of the human figure. So here's what I want you guys to do. I really want you to think about muscles from a sculptural point of view. Now I said the same thing when I did my lecture about hair, that hair is about mass. And once you start thinking about it in terms of individual hairs and lines, that's the kiss of death, okay? You have to think about this like you are a sculptor. So here's the thing about muscles. I think in a lot of anatomy books for obvious reasons, you'll see images like, okay, front side, side, back view, and you have to do that. I mean, there's no other way around that. But I think the consequence of that is when people don't study sculpture, they don't realize that there are so many muscles that go around the figure. So you might look at the external oblique that we're looking at right here and say, oh, well, that's where the external oblique is. Okay, I can see it from the front view. But the thing is, you guys, Look at how much of the external oblique you can see on the side view. You actually see more of it 
on the side, but it's also very visible on the front. And so that's the thing, you cannot think that muscles are necessarily isolated to a single view. There definitely are some that do that, but actually most of the muscles, the key muscles that I'm talking about today, most of them are visible from two views, if not three. So this is what you guys really need to pay attention to. So you have to realize that a lot of them you can see from multiple views. So for example, this yellow muscle that we're looking at here is the deltoid. And you can see it really well from the side. You can see it really well from the back, but you can also see it really well from the front. So it's a really sculptural, very three-dimensional muscle. And you have to think about muscles that way. It's so different than bones. Bones are a whole other story because so much of bone structure is underneath muscle. So we're dealing with a completely different beast here. This is why it's so, so challenging. And Darian is saying, does it count if I study muscle tones when it comes from animation? I don't know if you're talking about whether you're looking at the muscles at animation as a reference. I mean, for animation, you definitely, especially if you want to do character animation, study anatomy because it's very, very useful. Neil says what I find difficult is muscles that are more subtle. This is why I find it hard to draw forearms. I feel like when the forms are less prominent, my drawing falls flat easily. You know what really helps, Neil? Lighting. We had a stream the other day about light, specifically focusing on shadow. That makes all the difference in the world because if you guys have crap lighting on your figure, it's not gonna come out well. So make sure you get good lighting and references. Now, another thing you guys can be conscious of, and this may or may not always be visible, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, but it is a good thing to think about what is the direction of the form? Which way is it going? So you think about each muscle is like going somewhere, like it's traveling, it's got a destination. And so where do things begin and where do they end up? Now, again, there's a lot of complicated anatomy stuff. Like you can start talking about, adduction and abduction, and you can talk about origin and insertion. And you know what? I actually did teach an artistic anatomy and I tried to teach all that stuff, origin and insertion and all that stuff. But <laughs> when I reevaluated the syllabus, I was like, did that really make the students draw better? I think it didn't. I think it really confused them more. So you can look that up. You guys can look up origin insertion and all that fancy stuff. I still can't remember half of it. And I think I'm doing okay, so it's up to you guys. So if you look at this muscle, this is the pectoralis major. It's got almost like a fan-like shape. And so you can see it begins in the armpit and it fans outwards. So that's what you're looking for is the direction of the muscle fibers. You can see on the deltoid, which is the blue muscle on the right, that's a really different kind of direction that it starts at this point at the bottom and then it moves upwards. So the other thing about the muscle fibers is they really show the form really clearly. And then muscles like this, like the external oblique on the lower left is weird. Like you would never think that that muscle does that. So sometimes the muscle fiber is not that important. Like I've never really looked at an external oblique and seen muscle fiber like that. You do tend to see it sometimes on the pectoralis major. Like there's certain muscles, it's just more prominent than others. Okay, yes, this is Michael Fassbender, but he looks scary in this photo. So I can't really get excited about this because this was this movie he was in called Hunger. It was about this Irish hunger strike in a prison. It's a good movie, but it's really hard to watch because they do this hunger strike and they get very visceral about it. But anyway, if you look at the pectoralis major, you guys will notice that because the body is so thin and emaciated, that actually the muscle fibers, that they actually are visible in this image. And so th this is not typical. I mean, a lot of people <laughs> don't really look like this. This is so extreme. But I think that this is a place where you actually would see that because actually this is the muscle. So the whole mass of the muscle is the green shape that I'm showing you guys right now. But 
when you put the fiber on top, then you see that direction. Okay, so this is why muscles get complicated because they're a form, but they're forms that have direction, that have purpose. That's what you guys want to think about. Jamie is asking, does it, pectoralis major, attach to the clavicles? Yes, it does. It also attaches to the sternum. And I do have a chart to show you guys how that works later on. So these are the six, well, these are three. These are the first three muscles I'm going to review with you guys. Deltoid, pectoralis major, trapezius. So that's upper front, okay? And then on the lower front, we're going to talk about rectus abdominis better known as the six pack, the external oblique, which some people refer to them as love handles. Some people call it a muffin top. I mean, they're not very complimentary <laughs> names for the external oblique. And then also the serratus anterior, which to me is the cottage cheese muscle. And I'll explain to you guys later. I don't know. I just find that this helps me keep track of all the anatomy. All right, let's get going, guys. I think we better start with the upper front torso. And, you know, it's helpful to see the pectoralis major in motion because I just don't think you guys would truly understand what this muscle is if you don't get to see it actually moving. <laughs> oh man, you guys, I wanna watch X-Men so bad. Like I have not watched this movie in so long. Like I really am overdue <laughs> for watching this movie. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, so this is the pectoralis major. It's these two very large fan-like muscles that go across the upper section of the chest. And we need to see many different types of pectoralis majors because not every pectoralis major is the same. And I really feel that you guys need to see the nuances in the form and, and how pectoralis majors are different from white man to white man. These are all very important parts of your art education, you guys. <laughs> okay, now the pectoralis major, it is a muscle that you can see pretty visibly on the side as well, although it's more dramatic from the front. And let me just break down to you guys where it actually fits, because this is more of a figure drawing pose. And I think this is where people go, what? Because the thing is, most people I think can look at a chart like this. This is from Dr. Paul Roche's artistic anatomy book. And a lot of people can look at, oh, I know. Yeah, that's easy. No problem. I can figure out where that is. But the thing is, you guys, when you get onto a photo of a person, it's not so laid out for you. It can be a little bit confusing about exactly what's going on. So this is Misty Copeland who is a incredible ballerina. She was in a series of these Under Armour commercials. Maybe some of you guys have seen some of them. But anyway, really the place that I think about the fan shape of the pectoralis major starting, it's really in the armpit, okay? So if you look for the armpit, you will see the pectoralis major there. Neil says, sorry, Prof Lou, but what about pectoralis majors of women? Okay, so the thing about female to male pectoralis majors, okay, the difference is that on an average female body, you're going to have breasts, okay? And on most average female bodies, they tend to be larger than the breasts on a male. So the difference is that for a female upper torso, you have breasts that rest. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. The breasts rest on the surface of the pectoralis major. And you know, honestly, I'm going to have to figure out a way to do a stream about breasts and not get demonetized, but we will have to do that at some point because you know what? People do not know how to draw breasts. Like so many times in my RISD classes, people either make them like way too perky or they look like they're coming from out of the rib cage or they look too hard. Like people have so much trouble drawing breasts. So we're going to have to do that at some point. But the most important thing to know right now is that they sit on the surface of the pectoralis major. Okay. That's the important thing is to distinguish the two differences. Okay. Let's take a look. So remember our good friend, the clavicle, who I love, which is this set of bony landmarks that you see in the foreground. And you can see here, 
clavicles are pretty visible on, I mean, everything's visible on Misty Copeland. How can it not? I mean, she's got an incredible figure being a ballet dancer. And remember, we have the sternum, which goes right down the middle of the front of the figure. And remember, if you guys saw my other streams, I always call the sternum the necktie bone because it, it looks like a necktie. Come on, it totally does, like without the stripes. And so this is very helpful to know that it's a necktie bone and that it is a little bit below the clavicles. Steven says, white shirtless men. <laughs> All of a sudden, I love anatomy class. Wow, thanks for the anatomy for artist lectures. You're welcome. <laughs> They're fun for me, too. <laughs> Seriously, why does anatomy have to be boring? Like, why can't it be fun, you know? <laughs> Neil is saying, I need to learn how to draw women, too. So, yeah, I definitely need that strength. Yeah, th this is like the core basics of the front torso. We'll try to have streams that get more specific about gender. It's just the thing is, if you guys don't have this foundation first, none of the nuances that I tell you about gender and unique qualities are going to make any sense. This is the basics. So we will definitely build upon that. Maria says, I always remember the Frito Kahlo movie, Breasts Need Gravity. You know what? Breasts sag, okay? I know this. I have breasts. I know that they sag, okay? And for some reason, when people draw them, that concept goes out the window. So yes, we definitely have to do a stream about that. Okay, so here we have the clavicle. And then you guys see how she's bent? So notice that in my chart, I did draw the sternum. So it's a little bit more curved because you guys, it's so perfect. It, it's like a little puzzle, you know? Like you put pectoralis major, clavicle and certainly it's like that moment when you're doing a puzzle piece and it's like oh I got that last piece in there it just it feels awesome so this is the relationship between these three things so that's why knowing all that bony stuff it's like you just fill in the blanks with the pectoralis major it's fabulous now what somebody had asked earlier about does the pectoralis major attached to the clavicle is true, okay? So this is another important thing is that certain muscles are physically attached to certain bones. I don't know all of them, but I know the ones that I think are important and this definitely is. So you have to know that the pectoralis major, it does literally get attached to the sternum and the clavicle. All right, so now let's apply that to this actual photograph, okay? And so you can see we have the curvature of the sternum. Because the arms are raised, the clavicles are like pointing upwards, almost like a V shape, okay? And then the pectoralis major like fans out from the armpit, okay? So this is so similar, you guys, to what we were talking about the other day about like one thing leading to another, okay? Like in anatomy, nothing is isolated everything is connected to something else. And maybe it's not like connected side by side. Maybe it's like those muscles that go on top or underneath each other. Okay. Now, if you have a body that's a little bit larger, obviously the distribution of the weight changes, okay? So for example, if you're not Wolverine, because who is? Who really is Wolverine? I mean, there's probably like 0.001% of the planet that has a body like that with pectoralis majors that your average person does not have that, okay? So typically you won't have to articulate it with all that, you know, tension in the muscle, but you can certainly look for skin folds. So for example, in this figure of Queen Latifah, you can see there are these skin folds that are near the armpits. And that's like your indication of where that fan begins of the pectoralis major. It's just some of it's covered in fat. It's not, you know, all perfectly toned. Probably took months and months to get to that point. So we have the clavicles as well. And usually you guys, the whole thing about when you shift the weight of a figure, okay, not everybody's Wolverine. This is more of a typical person's shape. And so the clavicles, you notice that they're just not as prominent, like they just don't stick out as much because there's more fat that's actually filling that in. Okay, so now we have the sternum as well. 
And then that's your pectoralis major. Okay, so it's it's there. It's just it's not as pronounced. That that's the real difference. And we will also try to do more streams on more different body types. It's just it's hard to talk about all that stuff when we have to figure out all of these specifics in the basics. Okay. <laughs> I think it's time to talk about the deltoid. Oh my God, this is such a good deltoid. Like, okay, I love all the X-Men movies, but there's something about this scene. It's in the first X-Men movie. Tell me in the chat if you guys know the scene. Oh my God, like the, I watched it like three times today because I had to get one shot. I was like, I just need to scroll through and get the one shot of the deltoid that I need. But there's something about the scene how like you don't see his face right away. And then, oh my God, it's so good. I need to watch this. <laughs> okay, so here's the deltoid. All right, so the deltoid is sort of like armor. It's like, you know, all the fighter armory people in history, they always have something. I guess it's like shoulder pads, but for the lower part of your shoulders. But anyway, the deltoid is a very substantial muscle. If you guys want to just grab your deltoid right now, you can feel it. it. It's very pronounced. Like even on somebody who's fairly thin, it's a pretty beefy muscle. And that's the other thing you guys will notice is that certain muscles are, are big and beefy and thick. And there's other muscles that are almost like shoelaces that are very thin and very strap-like. And so I think the more important thing is that you guys understand like how dense is this muscle? How thin is this muscle? Does the muscle get thin and then get thicker? I care way more about that, you guys, than about all the stuff that's underneath everything else. All right, so let me show you the three views because the deltoid is definitely a muscle that you just can see it from every single view very, very clearly. And it is one of the easier muscles to identify. I think even if you're not Wolverine and you're not Michael Fassbender who also worked out on Assassin's Creed, and yes, I did visit all those websites who are like, get Wolverine's workout routine. I'm like, really? Is this what people Google? I want to have the anatomy of Wolverine, so what's the workout schedule? Like, really? I don't know. So anyway, you'll see from the side front and also the back, that it's a very visible muscle. And, and that's really what I want you guys to know is that there are some muscles that are easy to find. You're gonna see them in a second. There's others you gotta work a little bit harder. So it's tricky. <sighs> I just love this. <laughs> He's such a badass on this scene. Also, I love the Prussian blue tint. And I guess this would be, it's probably not quinacridone magenta. It's probably like alizarin crimson with like a little touch of cadmium. Anyway, he's got such good deltoids. You guys, come on. This is like this is like the easiest exam you could ever get. It's like, hmm, where are the deltoids? Duh, they're right there. Like it's so as clear as day. Okay. He he's got like awesome, awesome deltoids. <laughs> All right. Now the clavicles, we have to contextualize these too because you thought the clavicles were done. They're not. The clavicles are awesome. They make everything so much easier. And he's got good clavicles. What does he have that's not good? I mean, everything. <laughs> okay, and remember we have the necktie bone, which is the sternum. See, doesn't he look like he's wearing a necktie? Totally, like it totally makes sense to me. <laughs> And ooh, looks like somebody's identifying some things. Blue Wolf says, is that the acromion process sticking out and showing? Yes, he has great acromion. Oh my God, his acromion processes. I'm like, dude, I wish everybody on the planet had those. Because then my life would be so easy as an anatomy teacher. I'd like never have to explain because I'm, a lot of people, it is very hard to see. But for him, it, it can be very clear. <laughs> so that's the acromion process, the two little like mountain peaks that are near the end of the clavicle. And here's just a chart so you guys can see where the acromion process is. And you really see the acromion process, it really is like a landmark. Like it's, it's sort of like you're on your way to the trapezius, but you're still in the deltoid. So you take a little stop at the acromion process. It's like, you know, when you're trying to find some place and your friend is like, when you turn the corner and you see the 7-Eleven, that's when you know I'm three blocks away. That's what the acromion process is like. Look at that. 
Those are some sweet acromion processes. Okay, so everybody see this? It's amazing. It, it's so perfect the way everything fits together. I care more about you guys understanding the fit of the muscles than I do about all that technical stuff. I don't think that technical stuff is very helpful. All right, let's talk about, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Well, see, the thing is, I mean, he looks good in every X-Men movie. I mean, he's a lot younger. This was made in like 2001, but oh my God, <laughs> he looks so good in this movie. <laughs> okay, so this is the trapezius. And the trapezius will stump you because from the front view, you barely see it. It's almost like not there. And the important thing about the trapezius to know you guys is that it's behind stuff. It's behind the neck. Like you might look at this chart and think that it's just like right next door to the neck, but it really wraps behind. Like this is where I'm talking about the sculptor in you really has to come out for that to happen. Look at this, like from the back, it's a giant muscle. It's like a circus tent, like covers half the back, okay? But the thing is though, the trapezius, you really only see it up by the shoulders, okay? Yes, it wraps all the way down, like halfway down your back, but that part, you're not really gonna see that part that visibly. And the part of the trapezius that's in the neck, it, it's not that pronounced. I mean, only if you have somebody who's very, very thin, would that happen? So you guys will see that we're going to talk about a bunch of muscles where I can show you the silhouette, the shape of the muscle, but actually it doesn't have a lot to do with what's actually visible. So what you will see is the section that's like up here, like that you're going to see, but the stuff that's below on the back, the stuff that's in the neck, that's not so visible. So that's where muscles can trick you more because you think, oh, well, if that muscle is visible, it must be all visible. It's like, no, this, this one spot of the muscle, that is the spot you're really gonna see and this part is really not that important. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at Simone Biles because she has obviously an incredible back with an amazing center line, which by the way, you guys, is literally the spine, okay? So the image we have of Simone Biles, is not quite a profile view, but the structure on the right, the green spine, that's a side view of the spine. You can see it's very curved, okay? A lot of people think that the spine is straight and it does look straight from the front and back, but from the side, it's very curved. And you can see she's in like a very upright position. And so you really feel almost the regal, I'm a badass quality, which she totally is. Like, didn't they name some trick or move that she, and it's like, she's the only person on the planet who could ever, I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> Lisa is asking, does the trapezius pull back your shoulder blades? Pull back your shoulder blades. I'm trying to think about how that works. Well, we'll get to the back. Um, we're not gonna talk about shoulder blades today because it's just too much to pack into one stream, but I will show you guys how that structure works at some point. Okay, so here's what you have on the back. We have the center line, which is the spine, and we have the trapezius as well. Yeah, like Trent is saying, big, strong guys are gonna have visible trapezius. Yeah, on certain people, very visible, other people, not so much. Okay, so does everybody see how this works? So it's like, technically speaking, the trapezius, it does go all the way down. But the thing is, is like, you're not really gonna see that. You're really going to be paying much more attention on the back to the shoulder blades and the muscles that are over the shoulder blades. Those are really the muscles that are going to really take up all your attention. Like you're really not going to see the trapezius at the bottom of the back, but you are going to see it up by the neck. That's where it's like really, really clear cut. Oh, WC says they named three skills after her, two on the floor, one on the beam. Oh my God, that's insane. Sheesh. I mean, when I was a kid, we all thought Nadia Comaneci was it. And it's like, nope, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> okay, same deal, a chromium process. See, you guys are getting a good review. You know, it's like, I know it's been a while since we've done one of these streams. So we can all use a little bit of a refresher. Okay, so a chromium process, you can see it from the front and from the back. It's such a tiny bone. I mean, it doesn't really show that much. But you can see, look at this, isn't this amazing? How the trapezius, it just like 
stands out from the acromion process. It's it's so awesome. The acromion process is just making your life so easy. Like it's totally putting a stake down for where the trapezius can spread out from there. Really, really cool. Okay, so again here, not a lot of trapezius from the front, but the acromion process will help you a lot. And then look at this. So the clavicles are in front of the trapezius. Okay, you're not gonna draw the trapezius like next to the clavicle. Like really like your clavicles are here in the front, your trapezius is back here, okay? So this is where I think the more important thing you guys is that you understand spatially what's happening with the muscles. You understand how they relate to each other. That is way, way more important than all the aponeurosis, adduction, abdu ugh, you don't need any of that. You've got all this other stuff to think about. Okay, so let's look at the front of the trapezius. And so if I pull this back, the trapezius in this photo, it's pretty clear. And you can see it's a very dramatic form. It's got a lot of shade to it, okay? And now you have the clavicles, which are in front of the trapezius. Remember, think like a sculptor. This is why I, I seriously always said this to students. I mean, they would never have let me <laughs> do this ever. But I always wanted to teach an anatomy class that was half drawing and half figure sculpture and like do them simultaneously. I think that would have been amazing. I mean, maybe we should do something like that here. <laughs> yeah, cause, oh yeah, I don't have anybody to boss me around. <laughs> okay, so here is the sternum in the front. Here's the acromion process. And this is a great comment from Seven Angelic who says acromion process works like a bit of an anchor. Yeah, it, it's like a little, point that says, yep, you're on the right track. You're going the right way. All right, now let's take a look at what happens next. Let's do a quick review, okay? So we have pectoralis major, deltoid, trapezius. These are three muscles that we just reviewed. This is what they look like from the front. And it's like, wow, look at what holds them together. It's all the bones. So this is why I actually had somebody in the Discord, I think a few weeks back, they said, oh, well, do you guys have any videos on the muscles? I was like, oh, not yet, we're getting to that. But we do have these about bony landmarks and all this other stuff. And they said, well, yeah, but I wanna get ahead to the muscles. And I said, well, listen, have you gone through all the other stuff first? Have you looked at bony landmarks and the major structures? And they're like, yeah, but I really wanna learn the muscles. And I'm like, dude, there's no point in learning the muscles if you don't understand what's happening with the bones. Like, see this? Like, if you guys take these two things away, you just have three blobby forms that have nothing to do with each other, okay? When you put in the clavicle and you put in the sternum, it's like, oh my God, it all makes sense, okay? That's why you need those bony landmarks first. You can't start with the muscles. If you can't do the bones, you're not gonna be able to do the muscles. It's just gonna be worse. Acromion process right in there. It's, it, it really, it's like a puzzle piece. I just love it. Like, whoever designed this, I don't know. <laughs> It's a really did a great job. By the way, you guys, so, okay. I know I have my Michael Fassbender and Hugh Jackman storage of <laughs> stills. Although I have no problem searching for more. It's fine. That, that means, I suspect that's probably why these lectures take me so long. Cause I'm always like, oh, that's nice. Maybe I could use this one. Let's just find just the right pose. You know what's also great? Calvin Klein underwear ads. They're great, you can see everything. So anyway, I mined a lot of Calvin Klein ads for the lower front torso. Okay, and by the way, this is a campaign ad by Calvin Klein for, and they actually had the models in the Moonlight movie. You know the movie that like, they mistakenly said La La Land won the Oscar, but actually it was Moonlight. <laughs> Everybody remember that fiasco? So anyway, th this is what that campaign is from. So rectus abdominis, sounds complicated, but it's just the abdominal muscles. And I mean, this one's easy for a lot of people because a lot of people will go, oh, six pack. Yeah, okay, I get what that is. That totally makes sense. I really like this. Comcuke says, Associations with other things helps me memorize anatomy. Pectoralis major looks like sideways ginkgo leaves. Clavicle looks like bird wings. Flying squirrel trapezius. Oh, I really like that. Can I totally steal that from you? Flying squirrel trapezius. That is awesome. 
Really? Cool. I'm so excited. Okay. Now, a reminder, in case you guys haven't been doing your homework, the front center line, it's not the spine. Okay. On the back, it is. The back center line is the spine. But on the front, the center line that you draw, it's on the surface of the body. Okay. It's not inside the torso. It's on the surface of the body. You have to remember that because if you don't, the center line, the front is not going to make any sense. Okay. Here's your six pack. Okay. And so what's helpful with the abdominal muscles is to remember how the center line goes down the middle because, you know, this is all kinds of Halloween-y versions of abdominal muscles, you know, like people will draw like, oh, he's got a turtle shell. And, you know, I remember actually <laughs> when I was a kid, who here, this will reveal your age, <laughs> who here owned a plastic He-Man toy when they were a kid? I had one. And I remember the muscles were really, really bumpy. I, I wish I still had it so I could like count. <laughs> he probably had like a 12 pack or something like that, but it definitely was not accurate anatomy. But anyway, that's what your abdominal muscles are. And you can see the abdominal muscles, they're pretty flat because they look so big from the front view. But when you look at them from the side, you'll see they don't really have the the beef that say a deltoid has. So yeah, I mean, people can be very buff and have pretty pronounced abdominal muscles, but I feel like compared to say a deltoid, they're actually a little bit thin. So that's another important thing is to think about what the form is like. Okay, now the other bone that's very important to remember in the front, symphysis pubis. Okay, this is very important because this is another place where the muscles physically attach, just like the clavicles and the pectoralis and the sternum attached, you will have that here. Okay, so that's the symphysis pubis, is the pubic bone, which is in the lower section of the pelvis. Okay, so if we look at, I don't know how to say his name, Jimon Honsu? Anyway, he was in that great movie, Gladiator, with Russell Crowe when he was cute and buff. <laughs> anyway. So, okay, we have the center line here because you can see he's tilted a little bit. The center line is so critical. Like, you guys, if you can't do a good center line, none of this is going to help you, okay? That's why those basics, major masses, center line, bony landmarks, all of that stuff is important, you guys, okay? Okay. Here is the rectus abdominis. And this is a great question. Hellish D says, I don't think this is silly. I don't understand why they're called six packs. They don't look like only six. It looks like that, but you know what? The two muscles at the bottom, they're sort of like stretchy. You know what I mean? So it's, it, it looks, it's hard because it also depends on the person. Because on some people, there are certain muscles that look like they might be part of the six pack, but are not. So it, it, this is where, again, it's like you can't really apply the same standards to every single figure because every single person is completely different. Okay, so here's the symphysis pubis, okay? So does everybody see the rectus abdominis? It's, it's literally attached to the symphysis pubis, okay? That's why that is so important. Now, here's another important thing. People always mess this up. Usually when I'm teaching a figure drawing class, Typically, people put the genitalia way too high. Usually, it's like placed where the symphysis pubis is, but it's not. The symphysis pubis is above both the male and female genitalia. That's a very important thing to do. Most of the time when I see figures, people make the stomach not tall enough. They usually squish it. And part of the reason the stomach's not tall enough is because they put the genitalia too high. Okay, so chances are, if your stomach is like that, it's not because of the stomach, it's because of the placement of the symphysis pubis and the male and female genitalia, okay? You thought it was the stomach, it's not, it's your pubic bone. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the serratus anterior. And this little cutout that I made, that's not really what it looks like. It's just that there's latissimus dorsi over it. Like the serratus anterior is actually, it's kind of long, but it's like covered by something. So that's why that shape looks a little funky. Okay, this is the cottage cheese <laughs> muscles. 
<laughs> because they're like little bumps on the side of your body, assuming that you're pretty pumped up. I mean, if you're sort of a larger figure, you're not really going to see these that clearly. But this is the serratus anterior. And this is what I was talking about earlier, how it's like underneath another muscle. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And if you guys search up serratus anterior online, you'll, you'll see that it really is a lot longer. It's just it's like buried under all this stuff. And so the latissimus dorsi is on top of it. Okay, so actually a lot of the serratus is not visible. A lot of it is underneath the latissimus dorsi. Okay, so this is again where understanding that overlap becomes very important. W315 says, is the symphysis pubis above the top of the pubic bone? Well, let me go back and explain that because that's actually pretty important. So let me go back to here where I had the photo of the bone. There it is. Okay. So if you guys look at the chart of the skeleton in the upper section, you'll see where I've highlighted in green, that's the symphysis pubis. Okay. And then the genitalia is underneath. This is a great question from Neil who's saying, how do you know what the serratus is and what is ribs? Well, ribs tend to be longer looking. That's why I call the serratus cottage cheese because it's like little bumps. Like they don't tend to be very long. Whereas ribs generally tend to have a certain length to them where usually you can tell them apart. And also the serratus tends to be like closer to your armpit. It's, it's almost like underneath your armpit. And that's why when I showed you guys the front view, you don't see it that much, okay? Now from the side, it's more visible. So usually depending on the location and on the actual shape of the form that you're looking at, you can sort of tell from that. But again, it, it really depends on the person that you're looking at. Okay, <laughs> guess who's got really good, so, guys, th this is so awesome. I, I've been going on like a little, what, what's the word, diet. <laughs> I've been going on a little diet. It's sort of like Jordan told me that because Spider-Verse is his favorite movie, that he has to be careful not to watch it too much. And so I had to go on like a Michael Fassbender diet because I was sort of like over, I was like, don't look at it for a little while. And now I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> okay, so there's the serratus anterior. You guys see that? Okay, so take a, take a good hard look. <laughs> there's the serratus anterior. And so, yes, I know my silly, those look like Cheetos, don't they? Yeah, those are totally Cheetos. So if you look at my Cheetos, you'll notice they're short and they're round, okay? so. Just think, think Cheetos or cottage cheese, whichever one you guys want to think about, okay? And then the latissimus dorsi is over it, okay? It, it really just covers it entirely. I think we need to take a look at another view because, you know, Michael worked so hard on his physique for this movie and we just would not want that to go to waste. <laughs> okay, we have our Cheetos again. All right, everybody see those? And then you put the latissimus dorsi over it. The latissimus dorsi is like, I mean, I've never had this before, but you know, at spas, they're like, you can have a seaweed wrap. Like, that's sort of what I think of when I think latissimus dorsi. I think about somebody like wrapping me like a roll of sushi, like in seaweed. Like, that's really, the latissimus dorsi is a very thin muscle, but it like covers the whole lower half of the body and the serratus is the muscle that's underneath it. All right, external oblique. External oblique, really weird muscle. Let me explain. So the external oblique, it looks big on this front view, but actually you don't really see the upper part of it. You will, it's just that the lower part of it is really the part that is like visible on the average person. Again, this all depends on the person, okay? Certain muscles are not clear on other people and vice versa. Steven says, does that mean the serratus anterior is connected to the bottom of the pectorals? Does it connect in any way? I'm not actually sure about that, Steven. I think, I suspect that the serratus might be underneath the pectoralis major, but I could be wrong. 
you'll have to look it up and see the different layers. Like, you know, you can see lots of anatomy charts where they're like, okay, here's a skeleton, here's this muscle, here's that other muscle. I mean, that that's again, one of those things where it's like, you just don't see it as an artist. I mean, I'm sure if you're a surgeon, it matters, but for us, it doesn't matter so much. But yeah, it's like, if you're curious, you know, go ahead and take a look at that. Maria says the difference between the serratus and the ribs on the skin is that they're short. They appear short. That's the difference. Like if you guys look up an anatomical chart and you look at serratus, they're actually kind of long. It's just they get covered by the latissimus dorsi and the ribs, I think, do tend to stick out a little bit more unless you're Michael Fassbender in Assassin's Creed. <laughs> so it, it's tricky because depending on the person, you may not see it very well. Okay. So you can see a lot of the external oblique on the side and you can see where it like interacts with the serratus, but really does everybody see the blue arrow that's pointing? That is the part of the external oblique that really is gonna be visible, okay? Even on somebody who is larger, you will really see it clearly. The upper part of the external oblique, it's really thin. And honestly, I think it's more likely that you will see the form of the ribs up there than that you will see the external oblique. So that whole upper section, what I would look for, cottage cheese serratus muscles and ribs, okay? That sounds like a dish, ew. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a very good dish, anyway. <laughs> okay, there's a serratus anterior, does everybody see that? Okay, that's the external oblique. This is like a braid. It's a braid between the serratus anterior and the external oblique, but the one you probably will see better is the serratus anterior. Anterior, by the way, means front. Like all these anatomical names, they actually make a lot of sense because posterior is back, medial is in the middle, and lateral is on the outside. So those are helpful. Like if you guys want to study more anatomy, anytime you see anterior, it means front, something that's on the front of the figure. W315 says, serratus is a Roman general. Really? That's so cool. So maybe I can name my kid like Oblique. <laughs> like that would not be a good name. They'd probably get teased in school for something like that. Okay, so here we have external oblique. This is the front view and the side view. <laughs> you guys, Hugh Jackman, he's he's making it so easy for you. Okay. Could you get a more clear-cut pronounced external oblique. This is like if I gave you guys an exam and it was like open book and I wrote all the answers out for you. It's like, it does not get easier than this to identify external oblique, okay? But here's the thing, that's how high up it goes, okay? Everybody see that? But that is what you're really gonna see. So if I go back, does everybody see? It's the lower part of the external oblique that really has form to it, okay? The upper section is there, but it's thin. So you're not really gonna see that so clearly. Okay, <laughs> he's got a great example of this external oblique. Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> what I really wanted to do, they have so many pictures of him at the beach, but I can't use them because I guess the paparazzi are very protective about their photos. So I tend to rely more on movie stills because that's more acceptable. But you know what's hilarious? I think this is brilliant, actually. He said that when he goes to the beach, he tells all the photographers, okay, guys, I'm going to be there at three o'clock. And so they meet him there and they take all their pictures and then they leave. And I was like, that's great. Because then you're not having people bothering you all the time. They just get their pictures and they leave. I mean, I think that's so nice. That's so nice, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> So yes, Con Cuke is saying, so is the external oblique where the muffin top fat is? Yep. I don't know if you guys have heard that term muffin top. It's it's not very nice, but it's basically like the bottom of the muffin would be like somebody's pants. And then like the upper section of the muffin, which sticks out a little bit, that would be your external oblique. So yeah, that's what the muffin top is. Not nice, but yeah, people use that term. Or you can also call them love handles. I mean, people call them that as well. And this is another one of those things where even if somebody has a larger figure and it's not Wolverine, you're, you're gonna see those external obliques pretty easily. 
Does everybody see that? Like they, they really stick out a lot. And I think the extra obliques are great because they help you distinguish between the upper torso and the lower torso. So you really can see what's the difference between the rib cage and the pelvis because the torso does have to be subdivided in that way. So there we go, love handles. <laughs> see, they're, they're so clear. And again, this really would be going up to the top, but I think you guys will agree if you look at the photo, that really is the part that you're going to be looking at. All right, guys, it's time to review. There's a lot of things to go over. This is why with anatomy, I take it step by step because there is such a thing as too much information. And I would say to you guys, if you're studying anatomy and trying to improve, if the muscles feel overwhelming, don't do them. You're better off doing a really good drawing with a good skeletal structure and good bony landmarks than one that has everything but is disorganized because the muscles really can make things a pain in the butt for you. So don't feel that you have to do this because you can do a great drawing having the center line, having the major masses, putting in the bony landmarks. You can get a lot done with just that and not having the muscles, okay? So don't feel that this is necessary at this point. This is great. <laughs> See, Kendrell says the external oblique it's that chub that hangs over your pants. Yep, exactly. Seven Angelic says, are women's external obliques larger? It depends on the person. I mean, here's my feeling about gender, you guys, is that you will hear people say things like, oh, well, this is a more feminine figure or this is more masculine. And I'm like, I don't think it's that black and white. I think that You'll hear, actually, we were talking in the chat yesterday during the Procreate draw along. Somebody asked in the chat, well, I have a lot of trouble drawing female figures. Uh, it's easier for me to draw male figures. And I, I hear people say that all the time. That's a really common statement. But really, when it comes down to it, you guys, the gender of the figure you're drawing does not really matter. Because if you're drawing a figure and you want it to look like a person, I would suspect that you're trying to show an individual and that you want it to look like that person. I think it's more important to make that look like a unique individual than, oh, does that look masculine or feminine? Because also, depending on what culture you're from or what generation you're from, I mean, the generation today, the young people, I mean, they, they are completely redefining gender in a way that's so different than my generation. And so I just feel like, all the talk about I'm good at female figures, but bad at male figures. I, I just don't think it's necessary. I think you just think about the figure, the figure you're drawing and how can you express and capture their personality. Okay, so let me go back. Serratus, cottage cheese, remember? We have rectus abdominis, abdominal muscles, the six pack. Why is it always food references? I don't really get it. Anyway, <laughs> external oblique, pectoralis major, we just we need to look at this again because this is a really tricky muscle. It's it's hard to identify. So I I just need to provide more more examples because I, I need to make sure you guys understand the pectoralis major. It's very very important. <laughs> Here's another one because you guys need this. You know I I just feel like all the muscles. They're hard, but the pectoralis major, that is the hardest one. And so we need as many examples as possible. So you guys really understand this muscle. It's very important. <laughs> so there it is. But I like it better like that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there's a deltoid. Everybody see how this is filling in? It's a puzzle. Okay. Oh, best deltoids. So good. I love this. Sorry. I've been looking at these photos like all day. It's great. So there's the deltoids. Trapezius, which again, very small in the front view. There's the trapezius. See, this is helpful. Symphysis pubis, which again, pubic bone, remembering that the male and female genitalia is below. Okay. Clavicles. Look at that. It's like you put in the bones and everything makes sense. Okay. There's my clavicles. Now we have the sternum, the necktie bone, which is in the middle. There's the sternum. That's some funky 
necklace you're wearing, Wolverine. <laughs> I'm glad you don't actually wear that because you look like a big dork. Anyway, a chromium process, the two little mountain peaks, which we're going to thank Wolverine for. And we didn't get into this one because I'm going to do this more when we get into the legs. But if you guys remember and the bony landmarks, there were these two little dots that are to the side of the sensus pubis called the ASIS. And if you want to be a big dork, you can say anterior, superior, iliac spine. I feel like that should be like a cheerleading thing. You know, they could just like cheer all the anatomy. It'd be awesome. Okay. So what's nice about the ASIS is that it's really like at the corner of the external oblique. Like really, honestly, it's connect the dots. Just do that. Connect the dots, put together the puzzle pieces. You guys will be totally fine. Jamie is asking, the pectoralis majors move along with the shoulders. I think you're asking about like whether the pectoralis major is affected by the shoulders. Absolutely. Because if you think about, if you look at this chart, you can see that the pectoralis major, it goes under the deltoid. Okay. So if the deltoid's doing something, the pectoralis major is going to do something too. And probably what I'll do is at some point we'll do a stream where we can do more extreme poses. So you guys can see, okay, what does the pectoralis major actually do when Wolverine's jumping off of a cliff or <laughs> doing something crazy like that? But we can't do that fancy stuff until you guys understand this because th this is like the basics. And then we can get more complicated from what's going on. Right, pit of the neck. Everybody remember that? You can find it on yourself right now. That's the pit of the neck. And then to the left and the right, you're gonna feel your clavicles and then at the bottom, you're going to feel your necktie bone, which is the sternum. And then we didn't talk about this earlier, but the belly button, really good landmark. Obviously, it's mushy and soft and it doesn't have anything to do with the bony structure, but it's a landmark. It's really helpful in figure drawing. Like a lot of things don't matter. Actually, nipples don't matter that much. Actually, I should have said stipple. I hope that doesn't get me <laughs> demonetized. <laughs> but anyway, the belly button's really helpful. So definitely add that in. And then center line, you see, it, it all works. Isn't it great? It's like a math problem that ends up perfect. You know, when math problems just like everything lines up and it, it's awesome. It's just the coolest thing. Okay, so there's my center line. Okay, center line and Wolverine. This is it. This is everything culminating together that we have looked at so far, okay? It's not that complicated. It really is not. It's just, you have to spend time with it. That's all. This is why, I mean, I could get more complicated. I'm not going to because it's too much work. But uh, I think we need to look at the Vector Alice Major again. Oh my God, I love this gif. <laughs> this is a terrible movie. I can't believe I watched this movie. I can't even remember what it was called. I think it was called like Haywire. <laughs> so anyway, on that note, I guess I should go to the next slide, shouldn't I? <laughs> I probably should. <laughs> anyway, we do have other anatomy streams on drawing hair, drawing heads, drawing hands, because you know, Magneto with all his hands and everything, <laughs> drawing eyes. A lot of this stuff, it takes time to digest. It is worth, I think, and I'm not just saying this for YouTube watch time, it is worth it to review these things multiple times because it's not something you're going to figure out overnight. Also, if you guys want to review this stream, but you don't want to like watch the whole video again, you can just watch or not watch. You can just look at the Google. So if you guys want the link to that, that is in the YouTube video description below. You guys can click on that. And some people really like having access to the slides because sometimes you don't want to like sit through the whole video. You just want to watch and look at the charts and stuff like that. So definitely make use of that, you guys, because that's really, really helpful. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. Please meet me in the post live streams channel. The invite link to our Discord is in the video description below. Subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel so you can continue continue to develop and grow as an artist. And everybody, thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who keep us up and running. 
and giving us the financial resources we need to keep our prof free and available to everybody. Thank you so much for all of your questions, for tolerating my fangirling. <laughs> you know, stuff has to be fun. You know, life is difficult. And I just, I need some pectoralis majors. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much, you guys. I'll see you.